Hey everybody, Jeremy here. Today we have an interview for you. It's just me on the podcast. Ken is a little tied up at the moment, but uh, I sat down virtually with Joshua Shooping, who's a pastor in Arkansas. He wasn't always a pastor in a Protestant church, though. He was a priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church for a number of years. And so this episode is about Eastern Orthodoxy, what that church believes and teaches, and also his personal journey. We just kind of follow along his story, and I blurt out questions along the way, and we learn what uh, happened in his life that took him into Eastern Orthodoxy and then out of Eastern Orthodoxy. You've seen that this is a longer episode. It's a long-form interview, but I think you will learn quite a bit, especially if, I don't know, Eastern Orthodoxy is a little foreign to you as it was and, of course, still is for me. So I hope this is educational and uh, will help you grow in your understanding of what that church teaches and that this would be a, uh, a real encouragement to you that God is at work even in places that we know nothing about in our own backyard. But before we get into that interview, I want to let you know that this episode today is brought to you by my other podcast, The Better Pastor Podcast. It's a show that I've started on the side where I interview pastors about the practical skills needed for pastoring in the local church. So even though the primary audience is the local church pastor, I think that this would be a helpful show for anybody who's looking to lead in local church Christian ministry. There have been episodes so far on how to do hospital visits, how to conduct funerals for the unchurched, how much a pastor should share with his wife about the ministry. And there are episodes that are going to be coming out on how to develop illustrations as a preacher, how to express gentleness as a pastor, the pastor's attire and appearance, what mandatory reporting is with the state and how to go about doing that in certain situations. So the episodes are relatively short and they're always practical. And so I want to share a clip from a recent episode with you now, and then we'll jump into the music and then the interview on the other side of the music for this show, the Do Theology Podcast. But if you're interested in the Better Pastor Podcast, make sure to go wherever you get this episode that you're listening to right now and look up Better Pastor Podcast and subscribe. We'll catch you on the other side of the music with my interview with Joshua Shooping. But first, here's a clip from the Better Pastor podcast. In situations where, you know, you go in and you really feel like you're doing all that you can to make this a good, meaningful visit for the person. Um, and that, you know, as far as you can tell, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but the person is just unresponsive, uh, where it just seems like, for whatever reason, that person is not jiving with what you're saying um, and not being encouraged. How should a pastor process that? Because I'm sure in the moment it can feel like, well, I'm failing somehow because I'm not making this person peaceful or happy or anything. So what what do you do in those moments? How do you think through that? You know, I think my thoughts go back to that verse from Jude, you know, here in this situation, it might not be doubts specifically, but again, that whole idea of having mercy, I think is important in that moment, you know, that, that you don't draw unflattering or uncharitable conclusions about them or their responses in that moment. But then also, you know, I, I think here the the practical wisdom of not overstaying your welcome mm. uh, also comes into play. You know, if, if you get into one of those moments and like you say, it just seems like try as you might, that person just isn't responding well or, or you're not feeling much of a welcome to prolong your time, uh, then don't feel like you have to. And, and that's an important thing, I think, that we as pastors should remember as well, that even though in these moments, it's often expected that a pastor will be there, it's still not a moment where we can you know, force ourselves upon someone. It's still a moment where they have to allow us into their 
pain and into their suffering. Don't ask me what I feel about myself. Ask me what I know about God. Ask me what I know about his word. I just realized something. He wasn't sleeping on a pillow. He was sleeping on purpose. Something to say I think is important but not essential would be like the inerrancy of scripture. Um, oh wow. And okay. I hold to the inerrancy of scripture. Okay. The title of my sermon tonight is Why Church Nurseries Are Unscriptural and Wrong. And so that's why I have a baby on my hip right here. There is a level of anointing that I believe is gonna invade your homes, invade your sight, invade your senses. Um, that's going to, I literally feel that chains are gonna break off of you. Do you think I'm wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Yay. So am I a bad guy for saying you're wrong? Yeah. I am? Yeah. <laughs> that's not fair. Hey, by the way, you are a slave. If you're not a slave of Christ, you're a slave of sin. You aren't free. Choose your master. Give us some men who know the truth. All right. Well, Joshua, uh, thanks so much for joining me here on the show as we enter into the wilderness of Eastern Orthodoxy. Yes, thank you for having me on, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. It's a uh, it's an honor uh, to to be here, and you know I hope to be able to at least you know give a, a glimmer, you know, for at least from my my perspective, having gone through that world, um, you know, to to hopefully help you know uh, shed a little bit of light. Mm, amen. Well, as we were just talking before I started recording, uh, there's a little bit of selfishness in this interview with me because we had a Russian Orthodox church come to town a couple of years ago. And in Utah, that's very rare, just the second uh, Orthodox church in our state. And so I have a lot to learn. Uh, I have found that there are a few resources out there on this subject. And so uh, look, looking forward to this conversation. And uh, my goal here is to hear your story. And just as we go along and, and you're sharing your journey to just kind of interrupt you and, and blurt out questions along the way as I think of things that I want to know, or I think our listeners might want to know more about. And uh, I think this will make for just a really helpful conversation. But before we get into your story, how about if you can, I know this is really difficult, uh, but if you can give like a nutshell overview of what Eastern Orthodoxy is, and then we can get into the details of your, your story. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a big question. And I think everybody would probably give uh, a different answer approaching it from a different uh, perspective to, you know, depending on what they kind of see as like the like the most essential, which is one of the problems of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's like a kind of an, an illusion of monolithic agreement on certain things that when you dig into it, it actually doesn't it doesn't really exist. And there's a lot of deep divisions within the Orthodox church um, that are pretty fairly difficult to, to map. Uh, you know, uh, we could describe it in terms of its, its uh, ceremony, in terms of its liturgy. You know, it's a very liturgical church in the sense that it has like a very prescribed uh, set of uh, rites and rituals and observances uh, that they have uh, from their Sunday liturgy. I mean, every, you know, every hymn is already pre-prescribed, uh, you know, for centuries now. They've been a lot of the same hymns. Uh, the hymns are are so deeply established that they have dogmatic binding content. So whatever is sung is their formal official theology. Uh, the only thing that really changes is the uh, melodies. You know, they might have different settings of the songs. Uh, um, so uh, each Sunday will have uh, the same, usually uh, about the same liturgical structure. Uh, seasons can change that. So it might become, go from like one liturgy is called the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And then, you know, during another season, they might do the Liturgy of Basil the Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, during Lent, they'll have special Lenten services. They'll, so, you know, it's a very rich liturgical tradition because it was an entire state church apparatus uh, from the Middle Ages where the church was kind of the ev was everything it was their it was their religious center it was kind of almost like an entertainment center it was a social center it was a community center it was an outreach center uh and so the church was kind of like the the meeting place 
uh, maybe other than the marketplace uh, for people. So it has a, a, a lot of uh, diversity in, in so far as that. And that's kind of looking at it like liturgically in terms of like it's, it's, it's scheduling and worship cycle. Um, you could also approach the question theologically. Um, I mentioned that there is a lot of diversity there. Uh, they make a lot of claims to being very patristic. <clears throat> and in a sense, it, it does, uh, I think, uh, maintain a kind of patristic continuity. And let, uh, let's uh, d define that just in case that's going over somebody's head. Patristic oh, continuity. Let's, let's put yeah, those cookies so on the bottom shelf. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So patristic is a reference to what we would call the church fathers. Right. And so church fathers are those people who came after the apostles uh, and were famous major teachers uh, in the church, well respected or universally or or widely respected. <clears throat> so an example of a church father would be uh, Irenaeus or Athanasius or Justin Martyr or even Augustine in the West. Uh, would be a Latin church father. Um, Basil the Great would be an example of a church father. John Chrysostom would be an example of a church father. So if we kind of like put that into a single term, it would be called patristics, the study of these kind of church fathers, who they are, what they what they taught, what they said, what they established or whatever. And so, you know, the earliest forms of the liturgy were slowly kind of condensed and uh, consolidated uh, by certain very famous of these church fathers. For example, like there's a famous liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which we just mentioned. And so <clears throat> that particular structure of worship has been maintained more or less. It went through several variations or, or, or several uh, slight adjustments until you get until about the 7th century, 8th century, when it essentially got frozen in place and it stayed consistent all the way until today, uh, more or less. And so you have that kind of ceremonial continuity in terms of their ritual structures. So through that continuity of ritual structure, they make like the added claim that there's also no theological change in their church. So even though they've changed their doctrine that now they bow down and, and kiss icons and venerate painted images, even though that was rejected in the early church, uh, when you read the earliest church's testimony about pagan icons, they argue against all imagery hmm. until finally you get into uh, quote unquote church fathers. Uh, of later eras up into people like John of Damascus, where now they're using the very same arguments that the pagans were using for images. Now, Christian philosophers are using those same arguments and just kind of put in, putting the veneer of Christ on it. So you have like this liturgical continuity masking over this sort of ceremonial ritual continuity, kind of masking over this theological metamorphosis mm -hmm. that happens uh, related to bowing and kissing images or related to how they think about Mary. So for example, the one that kind of comes to my mind most immediately would be from Theodore the Studite. He was one of the most famous arguers for icons, uh, whether he was the 700s, 800s in that era. <clears throat> he wrote a very, uh, 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 it's a, a republished, it's still published a hymn, or it's called a canon, but a hymn that is a song basically that goes through eight or so verses, eight, maybe 12 verses, so many verses which is like a dramatic enactment of a sinner. And so it's so each verse kind of goes through a stage in the drama. Mm -hmm. And so this sinner says, I'm so sinful. Oh, Mary, he's praying to Mary, please go to Jesus and have him forgive me. And so that the first part of the of the of the song, you know, goes through him going to Mary. And then the next part goes to Mary going to Jesus and then Jesus answering Mary. And then Mary going back to the sinner. So it goes through this fourfold cycle so many times. And so when when the, the, the sinner goes to Mary, he confesses his sins to her, basically. I'm such a wretched person. I've sinned. Please go to Jesus. Jesus says, nope, we're not forgiving this guy. This guy is ridiculous. He's, he's, he's a sinner. We're not accepting his repentance. Mary oh goes back to the sinner and says, nope, the, the, the Lord of glory rejects you. And then the man says, oh, no, no. So now it goes through cycle two. 
um, of these sort of interlaced fourfold cycles. And then he says, oh, no, please go back to Jesus. Please go back to Jesus and pray for him to uh, and ask him to for he can't reject you. Have him forgive my sins. So she goes to Jesus again and Jesus says, no, nope, forget it. So that by the time you go through 12 or 13 cycles of this, you fi she finally wrestles Jesus where he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to forgive this guy. But for your sake, I'll overlook his sins, you know, for your sake, as long as he produces fruits of right, uh, repentance. And it's like this picture of Jesus as like an implacable person who who like doesn't really want to save people. And so this is the same guy who's arguing for icons. Theodore the Studite is writing this hymn, you know, on 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 Monday and on Tuesday he's defending icons, you know, or on Monday he's defending icons. And wow. on Tuesday it's like this sort of like Mary centered kind of uh, soteriology. And that gets continued all the way to Gregory Palamas in the 1300s or so, 1400s, whenever that was. And so he's arguing, you know, that you can't go to Jesus even presently because you have to go through Mary first. And she's the one who grant even angels have to go through Mary to 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 be in, in Christ's presence. And so contemporary Orthodox theologians will try to go all the way back to Irenaeus and Irene, where Irenaeus said in the 200s, 100s, 200s, you know, in that early generation in the 200s, where he's talking about, I believe it's the 100s. Um, I get dyslexic sometimes when I'm, uh, you know, uh, going through some of these dates. But just say that, with confidence that, and none of us will be uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. So. And so uh, Irenaeus gives this kind of like historical theology that salvation came through Mary in the sense that Jesus is salvation. Personally, he is salvation, you know, and so salvation, he'll say, came through Mary as like like a historical claim, like a typology almost. And so he's not saying that Mary is like a gateway to salvation. He's just saying that that salvation was born through Mary. And so that's like a subtle typological kind of argument about a history, historia salutis, you know, the history of salvation that that Jesus came through Mary, like as a mere historical fact. But then these later fathers like Theodore or these later th fathers like Gregory Palamas, they like turn that into like a transcendental principle. So mm -hmm. now she's also like a heavenly that Jesus always has to be accessed through Mary. So even though Irenaeus said nothing of the sort, they'll t contemporary Eastern Orthodox will try to say, oh no, if you go back to Irenaeus, he's saying the same thing, even though it's a completely different argument. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just saying that, no, Jesus is our savior and he came through Mary. And that's just what we're saying. Salvation came through or the the light. Jesus is, is the light or he's the truth. The truth came through Mary, you know, but he's not saying that now we have to go through Mary, just that that Jesus is God incarnate. So it seems like in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's similar to several other, I don't know, types of churches that make a claim of being the one true church, mm -hmm. that there's this constant need this constant motivation to connect whatever you're believing or doing today with what was happening in the earlier centuries, because there's almost this comfort of continuity, whether that's real or projected onto history, uh, that yeah. people are pursuing that because there's some sort of a comfort there in believing, see, we are the one true church because this guy here said something that sounds like what we're doing today. Would, would that be a right way of thinking about that? Yeah, one of the big things uh, that draws people to the Orthodox Church really in some ways is the decay of the we of Western civilization. Hmm. Um, you know, like modern, postmodern America, you know, people want to know, uh, like, did my church just come to exist like five years ago when my, you know, the guy who says he's my pastor, you know, ate some bad chilies from a restaurant and like woke up in the middle of the night with visions and an upset stomach, you know, and now he feels moved by God to start a church. And now there's this whole new denomination, you know. And, well, and just the general silliness that takes place, the goofiness in in many churches in America and in the West of, I don't know, I, I call them demon circuses sometimes, just like performance art that is so man-centered and has nothing to do with 
true high worship. I, I imagine that would drive people away from considering Western religion. Yeah, in in many ways, that's that's absolutely true. Where and so many churches have capitulated to entertainment culture, to consumer culture. Um, you know, where it's you know, I mean, like it's it's yeah, it's it's pandemic. It's a spiritual pandemic. You know that that we're kind of having uh, in today's world, and so it uh, when people are looking at churches, they'll want to see if they can look past contemporary history, even past the modern era, even past the Middle Ages. You know, it's like, is there something that's unchanging? Is there something that will, la- like, if America fell apart tomorrow, God forbid, you know, uh, we, you know, would there be a church that would also, like, if the lights went out, would be able to survive? Hmm. You know, well, the Orthodox Church, even a lot of Roman Catholic churches, Oriental Orthodox churches, I would say maybe even Anglican churches, you know, with their Book of Common Prayer, like they know what their worship is. But in a lot of low church evangelical environments, uh, non-denominationalism, like that sort of thing, you know, there's like disputes. Well, how do we worship? What's our structure? What's this? What's that? You know, and it's like, well, now we have a new pastor, so we're doing everything different, you know. And so there becomes like a lot of confusion and people get sick of it. Yeah. You know, uh, and even well-meaning, well-intentioned people. And so if they start reading, I would, have you ever heard the saying, uh, if you study sci- uh, study a little bit of science, you'll become an atheist. But if you st- study a lot of science, uh, you'll become a theist. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, that that, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think that there's a similar sort of thing with Eastern Orthodoxy. I think if you study a little bit of history, you might become Eastern Orthodox or Oriental mm-hmm. Orthodox or Roman Catholic. But I think if you study a lot more history, you'll realize that the reformers knew what they were talking about when they were dealing with those sorts of issues. Um, because the gospel is a real thing and getting the gospel wrong is a big deal. And so I guess that's like another issue that kind of comes to my mind in terms of how Protestants get can, can get sucked into the Eastern Orthodox Church is they come from like an evangelical paradigm where like it's very gospel centered and very Christ centered. And they take that lens with them and smuggle it into the Eastern Orthodox Church. And then they start projecting that vision onto this alien paradigm hmm. without realizing it. And so they say, oh, no, the liturgy quotes scripture all the time. The liturgy talks about Jesus all the time. They're talking about Jesus. Oh, this is so great. And then they start filtering out like this whole Mary issue, this whole icon issue, and they start trying to explain it all away. And the cultural tensions say, well, no, I have to be here because there's nothing else over here. But then by the time you get to second, third, fourth, fifth generation of Eastern Orthodox, the paradigm of the, the evangelical paradigm that the first generation came in with starts to evaporate Hmm. second generation kind of imitates mom and dad the third generation that second generation doesn't know how to convey that gospel paradigm the fourth generation you know they essentially lose it and so then it just becomes a part of that kind of like ritual i would consider semi-pelagian system of eastern orthodoxy i've been rambling a lot forgive me no, that's okay. Uh, I have a, I have a lot of questions, and I imagine I'll have opportunity to uh, ask them as we get into your biography here and go through your story. And so, let's go there. Uh, you were born at a very young age. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, day one, I began to breathe. You know, of my forty forty some odd years ago. Um, were you born into Eastern Orthodoxy? No, um, I was born in kind uh, in Florida you know, evangelical country. Um, one of my earliest memories, uh, actually, is kind of uh, funny to me. So I guess it's to my shame now, but arguing with my mom, I don't want to go to church. You know, she's mm-hmm. trying to take me to church or whatever. Um, my dad worked really late at night as a musician, you know, and so that was what he did professionally mm-hmm. to provide for the family. And so my dad slept in. So I was like, oh, my dad sleeps in. I want to sleep in, you know, and so I, I, I would resist. But my mom would take me to church. Uh, my mom was a kind of a searcher, you know, a, a, a really good lady. Um, she brought me to a, a Methodist church. She went to a Methodist church and I w- eventually was baptized when I was like 11 or 12. Uh, in right, a Methodist real, real quick, I, I can't let it go because this is going to bug me. Sure. Your dad made money as a musician. That's kind of rare. What, what kind of musician was he? What was he doing? 
He was a jazz pianist. Wow, that's awesome. I love jazz piano. Yeah, he uh, moved from New York. Uh, he was from upstate New York, and he came down to went down to Florida in the, like the Space Coast, you know, NASA era during like 60s and 70s and stuff like that, when that was like a blowing up scene, you know. So he would drive out to, you know, some of those various, you know, places where they're going to have jazz uh, uh, piano, and he kind of like ran a, a trio so he would bring in like musicians and stuff like that. I remember seeing when I was young, like at the beach, if we went, drove over to like Cocoa Beach or something like that, an airplane would go by and my dad's name would be like in the little letters kind of trailing wow. behind, you know, the Norm Shooping Trio, huh. you know, playing at such and such, you know, restaurant or, or whatever it was. So, so yeah, that's, that's what he did. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. It, not, not too many people can make a living at all playing piano or uh, being a musician. So I, I didn't know if we were talking like rock band or what he was doing. So that's, that's a helpful clarification. Uh, but Methodist, yeah. you, you were in the Methodist church. Yeah. Yeah. Methodist church went to the, you know, the youth groups went through that kind of process. Um, but my mom wasn't able to, to go there for a very long time, be consistent, you know, in, in terms of attendance there. And so then I wouldn't go to church for a little while. Um, but by the time I'm getting into high school, um, really middle school, I'm starting to attend youth groups and church with my friends. And then locally, like in the neighborhood, we had a church that was about, I think, a brethren, Grace Brethren Church or mm -hmm. something, uh, maybe a half mile at the most from from my house. So me and a neighborhood friend, we'd go there. So, you know, kind of low church, evangelical uh, kind of environment. Went to the youth group uh, once a week um, and uh, went to Young Life during high school, you know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Young Life or if anyone's mm -hmm. familiar with that. It's kind of like a, a youth group that kind of move, goes through high school, you know, rather than through like a local church, you know. And so it was at a friend's house. His dad was kind of like a, a director in that program. And so went there throughout high school, went to Windy Gap, like a, like a Young Life kind of like a retreat kind of thing for a week. But I was never really persuaded fully to become Christian at the time. Did you ever um, make a profession of faith? No, not 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 during uh, my youth, during that time, during like high school or or anything. Um, my friends like just were all my my best friends were all Christian, except for me and my uh, one one of my other best friends. We weren't Christian, but all of our whole circle of friends they were they were all Christian. So we'd argue and debate, and then play basketball, and then play video games and debate and. And we were nerds and we would like watch documentaries of like from National Geographic and drink soda while like other high school kids were drinking beer and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like we would be like, you know, the, the the straight edge cool guys, you know, who were doing like the nerdy stuff. And so we did uh, those sorts of things. But and and like I really was just like blessed with the love of Jesus, you know, to like from them, mm -hmm. you know, like they really showed me God's heart. You know, uh, they welcomed me. We would debate, but we'd be friends, you know, and so we would have like vigorous conversations and and yet be able to at the end of the day, like still be best friends. I mean, they're still my my friends uh, to this day. And so. Uh, but like in terms of like the theological meat of Christianity, like I just I had no inroad to that. Nobody was able to convey that to me. I didn't know where to go. And so it just kind of was like. Well, Jesus is really cool. I love Jesus. And when I read the the red letters, you know, it just kind of like had implicit rightness and authority to me. But trying to wrap my head around the incarnation, the Trinity, you know, like these sort of like core doctrines that, you know, what make Christianity Christianity, you know, like there was really not much explanation. Hmm. And so I ended up studying a lot of like Far Eastern philosophy and theology, you know, going as far from China and Japan and like moving my way slowly west. So like Confucius know. and Buddha and that kind of stuff? Yeah, Taoism, Buddhism, whether that's Zen Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism or Mahayana Buddhism or, you know, uh, you know, Islam, some of the different sects, you know, Sikhism. Uh, Hinduism, like the various kinds of Hinduism, like I'm reading those books and kind of trying to think through some of those issues. Um, and so like I was getting like theological meat there. Of course, it's we understand that it's not true. It's certainly certainly not saving, mm. you know, and so it's like but that's where I was like trying to kind of figure things out. But I didn't kind of find out until like my later 20s 
And this, this to me was like, I don't know, like God just kind of like, kind of like pulled up a veil or something Mm -hmm. that I was like looking for Christ the whole time. And it was like, I was like, almost like if you're familiar with art, you have like positive space and negative space in an image. And so it's like, if you have a portrait, you have like this sort of like, like the face is here. That's the positive space. And then like around the person in this kind of zone is the negative space. Yeah. And it was like, I was like all in this like negative space, you know, these far Eastern false philosophies and theologies. But I was like trying to mm-hmm. like outline the positive face of Christ. And when all of a sudden, like I was able to like access the, uh, like who Christ is, like, what does it mean that the word of God incarnated? When all of a sudden I saw the power of that, and when I saw who and what, like the what and what the Trinity is and who the Trinity is, I'm like, wow. And it was like all of a sudden, like the face of Christ shined through. And it's like, that's who I was looking for. That's like it was like the love that my friends had shared with me. Now all of a sudden had a I was able to kind of like map it together with with the head and the heart, so to speak, or you know, like the heart and the thought, you know, to like go together. And so that's what happened like in my later twenties. Okay. And, and that, and that ex- happened through what venue? What was it? Uh, just the books you were reading or what was it a person? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, so I kept attending churches, you know, after high school, um, I would, I even attended, a an emergent church, you know, oh. uh, that was for like 20 somethings. And I mean, this was a church, uh, uh, in South of Orlando, which I mean, for 20 somethings, they had like seven, eight, 900 people in their 20 somethings all going to this church um you know and so that was kind of like an amazing thing for me but it was like i kept orbiting around church well yeah i mean if you're thinking about uh defining that positive space the emergent church wasn't a place for that right very postmodern vague spirituality very much so and yeah. so i never got but it was all i can really say it was god's grace you know that was just like moving me to, to like, I can't give up on this. Like I have to keep. And so at a certain point, my wife and I were, uh, our son was on, on the way she was pregnant with, with our, our eldest, with our son. And it was like, when I say God spoke to me, I don't mean in any kind of like woo woo sense, but it was like, all of a sudden, like all of the thought from like my Christian upbringing and all of this other philosophy and theology that I had studied and was trying to make sense of in my mind, it was like, it came to a head in like this kind of question as if like God was saying to me, what do you want to give your son? Your best guess of all of this stuff you're trying to balance and figure out and synthesize and integrate and your natural genius, or do you want to give him my best? Wow. And it was, it just came with such clear authority that it was like, I have, I have to go to, I have to go to church. I can't, I can't play with this. And I have to connect with something that's not just trying to figure it out for the first time. And that's when I started falling into the trap of Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay. Cause now I'm starting to try to look for, well, which among the churches do I need to go to? And it, it, so, it was almost like, I mean, forgive me for using Utah, my Utah context all the time, but it's like your Joseph Smith moment of which church is true. Uh, and you had to discover which church was the right church, right? Yeah. Almost from kind of scratch in a way, even though I had grown up, spent time in a Methodist church and, and lower evangelical kinds of churches, emergent church. And it's like, now it's like, I don't know, like I had this kind of thirst for lowercase O orthodoxy, you know, like I want the real thing. I'm sick of people just making stuff up, you know, like I've been making it up my whole life and trying to figure it out and piece it together. I need to submit to God's truth in his word. So, so what was um, it about Eastern Orthodoxy that pulled you in? Yeah. So, um, I, so when that moment kind of happened, I was attending, uh, I would sometimes if like, depending on what time we woke up, like we would sometimes attend, uh, God kind of put me in the way of a reformed Baptist evangelist. So we'd sometimes go and visit a Reformed Baptist church. Uh, One of my friends growing up uh, in middle school and high school, his older brother was a pastor in a Calvary Chapel church. Hmm. And so sometimes we would go to a Calvary Chapel church. Uh, 
And then so I'm also studying. And so I've studied Far Eastern stuff. So now it's like, wait, there's an Eastern Christianity? And so I start like reading about that and I'm like getting the literature like, oh, the Eastern Orthodox Church by Callistos Ware and, you know, the Eastern Way and the mysticism of the Eastern Church by Vladimir Lasky. And I'm starting to read that stuff and I'm starting to see some of the richness of Trinitarian theology in Eastern Orthodox literature. I didn't find this out until later, but there was kind of like a renaissance in the Eastern Orthodox Church in like the 1800s and 1900s, rediscovering and going back to some of these church fathers. They had become just kind of like a liturgical, ritualistic kind of church in a lot of ways that just kind of did things by rote. Like if you would have asked your, you know, your your regular attender of an Eastern Orthodox Church, like who is Gregory Palamas and what did he teach? They wouldn't have been able to tell you. But in the 20th century, in the 21st century, they're like unpacking all this so that now if you go into a convert heavy Eastern Orthodox church, they're going to start getting into a discussion with you about Augustine versus Palamas or something like that, or or how Aquinas got things wrong and how Palamas got things right. Or they're going to be discussing these like really obscure church father, philosopher, theologians, you know, and it's like as if that's like common Eastern Orthodoxy, but. So, so the a, philosophical debates within Eastern Orthodoxy have really drawn, uh, well, not not within Eastern Orthodoxy, within religion, have really drawn a lot of people to the Eastern Orthodox Church over the last hundred years or so. Then you would say is that digging up some of these older philosophical works and seeing them as the preservation of truth in the Eastern Orthodox Church. That's been a big draw for people to convert to Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah. So you'll find like a famous theologian like Maximus the Confessor arguing over the subtle topic of whether Christ has one will or two wills. Right. So will corresponds to nature, Mm -hmm. you know, and so he has a divine nature. Therefore, he must have a divine will. He has a human nature. Therefore, he must have a human will. Um, So Christ has two wills, you know, in one person. And so that kind of flowed out of an argument of whether Christ had two natures or one nature, monophysitism versus diophysitism. So now you have monothelitism versus diothelitism or whatever. It's however you pronounce that. Right. And so like people are going back and kind of like rediscovering Maximus. I mean, the Maximus during his lifetime was condemned by the church as a heretic, had his tongue cut out and his hand cut off, you know, and so like he died, you know, in ignominy, you know, in shame. But, uh, you know, so his works were kind of like rediscovered in a lot of ways in the 20th century and 21st century, and they're being translated into English. And so now people are thinking like, oh, this is this is Eastern Orthodoxy. This is this great, rich philosophical tradition and thought that's kind of like protecting, you know, Orthodox, lowercase o, Orthodox doctrine. And Augustine and the Filioque ruined everything. And Aquinas and scholasticism ruined everything. And so now we're going into this Eastern Orthodox area where it's like it has this continuity, but it seems like it has the answer to all of the problems of the Western church. Mm. So if you're growing up and it's the decay of Western civilization and you want to know which church to go to, well, why not go to the church that's not a part of the Western decay? Go to the part, well, I mean, the Eastern decayed in and of its own self, but now it's made to seem cool and exotic and interesting and mystical and deep and profound and philosophical theology. And, you know, when we have all this experiential mysticism and stuff like that. And so it gives this veneer that this is authentic Christianity. And so if you're reading that little bit of history, if you're kind of a bookworm and you like to read You come across these authors and you start to read it and you say, well, this must be it. And so you square the circle, you put yourself in the Eastern Orthodox Church and the West is evil, usually. And that's what happened to you. Yep. That's just what happened to me. So I got to leave the, the, you know, like the, I I liked the Reformed Baptist Church where I was, but he's preaching against heresy. He's preaching penal substitutionary atonement. God, uh, Jesus satisfied God's wrath. Oh, now it's just, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Well, I don't want to be there. I want to be in the cool, mystical, peaceful church, you know, that's like Eastern and cool. And what's the alternative to penal substitutionary atonement that was drawing you? Uh, instead of Jesus satisfying the Father's wrath or Jesus satisfying God's wrath generally, what what was it that was drawing you on the Eastern Orthodox side? Well, uh, they'll, they'll usually say, and this would be like Christ, the Christus Victor model, you know, Christ defeated death. 
And now you can participate in that divine life where you also overcome death through your kind of like mystical practices and stuff like that. But then I, you know, you learn later, you know, like, well, at least for myself, that Christus Victor isn't an atonement model at all. Because defeating death doesn't atone for anything. There's no connection with the actual concept. Like if we're going to define the word atonement, you know, it's like an, and an atoning act. Defeating death doesn't atone for anything. Mm-hmm. It just removes an obstacle. Now death is no longer an obstacle. But now if I'm semi-Pelagian, now I can work my way through all of that, through my mystical practices and obeying the church and the sacraments and all of that stuff. And so now I start to go through this ladder of divine ascent, even a book called The Ladder of the Ascent by John Climacus, you know, and then you, when you die, you go through the toll houses, you know, it's like, do I survive the, the passageway through all the demonic hallway, you know, like, do I survive that as I go through? And so Eastern Orthodoxy becomes like a, it appeals to the I when I say pagan mindset, I actually want to go deeper into like I think the fallen gen, like the genetically fallen mindset. You know, it's like I think natural man when he's born works righteousness just makes sense. So could you go ahead and define semi-Pelagian just because we've mentioned it a couple times here. And just in case that's going over someone's head, I, I imagine sure. we'll be saying it more <laughs> as the interview yeah, goes yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. So semi-Pelagianism would be just a semi-version of Pelagianism. Uh, Pelagianism just being the idea that uh, I can basically make myself right with God through my own efforts purely. And I don't even really need grace. Um. So that was, of course, condemned centuries ago in the era of Augustine. The East also affirmed that condemnation of Pelagianism. But semi-Pelagianism is somewhat similar, I think, and I would even consider this uh, some of the new perspective on Paul to kind of dovetail with this uh, semi-Pelagianism, where you get in by grace, but you keep yourself in by works. And so, yes, I'm brought in, I'm a sinner, and I realize now I'm brought in through baptism and confession or walking the aisle, you know, whatever it is, I'm I'm brought in through this, this sort of like ritual conversion sort of experience. And but then I'm kept in by the sacraments of, you know, whether that's communion or confession and absolution or, you know, just the life and schedule of the church and then my prayers and my mystical practices work to transform me and so somehow it becomes this like really blurry system of it's like where does grace end and and i begin and so then they call that synergism which i think is a completely false view of synergism uh i think biblical synergism uh of course post is after monergistic regeneration but once we're regenerated our will can cooperate with god um, but I think we're working with the energy that he supplies. So synergism is actually a, a submitting process to his energy and his will and his working in us and through us as a rather Christian than my energy plus his energy. Hmm? Yeah, that's as a Christian in sanctification, as opposed to working your way toward justification or working your way toward salvation. Yeah, because you can certainly fall in and out of justification according to their model. Wow. You know. And, but, you know, the West thought through those issues a lot more deeply than the East did. So, and people don't understand that, like that they're actually going to a more, like a less thought out version of that. So uh, a process of conversation and thought so that now they just have fuzzy atonement. They just have like fuzzy sanctification, fuzzy justification, but they come in with their kind of evangelical paradigm and like project a a clarity onto there that doesn't actually exist. Mm. Well, I've heard you talk about how central penal substitutionary atonement was to your becoming a Christian uh, and coming out of Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, but you know, before we get to that part of your story, I'm, I'm curious because you're saying the the Christus Victor model of the atonement actually feeds into that semi-Pelagian view of working your way toward justification, and it doesn't really address the atoning of sin. So what? What was what is said in Eastern Orthodoxy? Or what was your experience in hearing 
their teachings on atonement? What was there anything about how sin was actually dealt with? No, I, it it uh, it's just it's just kind of uh, forgiven. You know, it's like it's forgiven through absolution, or it's just like. But in terms of how we explain that through the atonement and the atoning work of Christ on the cross, there's like a disconnect. So it's like what Christ did on the cross doesn't necessarily really deeply connect with how, like what that does in terms of atoning, because you'll have contemporary Eastern Orthodox theologians rejecting substitution. Hmm. So it's like somehow it's forgiven in Christ, but not because it's a substitute and not because he paid a penalty. It's just kind of forgiven. So it just becomes very fuzzy. So that's what I mean. It's kind of like they're going back to like an earlier save point in the game, you know, to use like a metaphor or whatever, where it's like they hadn't really thought through that mechanism. They ignore church fathers like John Chrysostom and Cyril of Alexandria, who very clearly teach penal substitutionary atonement, not using that language. It's like the concepts there. And so people say, oh, well, penal substitutionary atonement was invented by Anselm. No, that satisfaction theory is different than penal substitutionary atonement. And you can and so you find very clearly in uh John Chrysostom's commentary on 2 Corinthians 5:21, I mean he gives the image like imagine that there is a king who is about to execute a prisoner. But the the king's son takes on the guilt and the punishment of that criminal to cl to clear the criminal of all of his wrongdoing. It's like that's just a description of penal substitutionary atonement. And so they say, oh, no, no, no. Well, he doesn't use that word or that or that that phrase or that term penal substitutionary atonement, even though we see that it's substitutionary and it's penal and it's atoning. Wow. And so yeah. it's like, yeah. OK, um, I guess it's there. And so when I started discovering that in the church fathers and seeing how far contemporary Eastern Orthodox thought has departed from penal substitutionary atonement, I was like, wait a second, maybe the West has something to what it's saying after all. And then I started like all of a sudden out of in my memory, it's like what I heard in the Reformed Baptist Church was actually right on. Hmm. And now I can see why they were so intense about preaching it. Well, and it's an amazing commentary on just what can happen to people. You were drawn into a movement, a church, a denomination, however we want to categorize it. Hook, line, and sinker. I mean, you became a priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church without understanding how your sins were atoned for. I mean, that is just a wild thing to consider. I mean, that that should be obviously the a, a person's entrance into the Christian church is believing the gospel, understanding that as first Peter two twenty four says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that that is just a, a the critical heart of the gospel. It's how we're made right with God, but you were fully immersed in this church without that knowledge because you were drawn by other things. And I want to even say that, that how, well, you just sort of summarized that truth. Like, I think we can, I think we can get to the point where we don't realize how hard won, how hard fought that truth is. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the Reformation didn't happen for no reason, because we can go centuries losing that truth and it getting obscured and getting dusty on the shelf and forgetting it and then putting something in its place and it gets pushed back and we don't even realize it's there and oh yeah that person kind of remembered at one time and it's like keeping the clarity and simplicity and directness of the gospel is a precious truth mm -hmm. you know and there's 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 a, a you know a plethora of religions out there also for a reason, because of the nature of fallen man's psyche to generate any number of ways to try to get right with God. Even if they don't fully know, even though they don't fully know who that is, we're all born with this sort of knowledge that makes us, it's, we're inexcusable, oh man, you know? And so it's like, we're all trying to make ourselves right somehow with this thing that we intuit as ultimate reality, ultimate truth. We don't know that that's God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we're still trying to relate to what we're intuiting. And so pagan man creates all kinds of methods and 
and modes and and practices and paths and you know in order to try to to make their to ease their conscience you know to try to ease the weight of the alienation that we feel from our heavenly father mm-hmm. you know and and so the orthodox church in my opinion has just created a version of that that says jesus in a lot of places so that they can say lord lord You know, have we not performed the liturgy in your name? Lord, Lord, did we not fast in your name? Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? You know, like I made, like I obeyed all of these things. I was a good person. I I even did what you said, according to the church. You know what I mean? According to how the church wants to frame that, you know, but none of it has the, I actually have really truly surrendered any faith or hope in myself. And it's all 100% your righteousness given to me on my behalf. So it's like they actually end up rejecting in a lot of ways, at least formally, you know, whether people in their in a congregation or here or there somehow gets the gospel right intuitively is a totally, I think, a, a different kind of question. But like formally, it's like, oh, no, you can't just trust in Christ's righteousness alone. You have to have the absolution of the priest. You have to be in the Orthodox Church because, I mean, they say if you're not in the Eastern Orthodox Church, you're condemned. Mm. And they ritually condemn all heretics yearly. And so that means Lutherans, that means uh, um, uh, Reformed people, that means non-denominational people, that means Anglicans, that means all of them. They're all outside of the church, outside of the saving ark. And and going to it. hell? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they pronounce what's called an anathema, uh, which is distinct. When you look at the actual language in their canons, there's a distinction between excommunication and anathema. So it's like you have excommunication on one hand, which is bad enough, but anathema in their own canon law reference works. Uh, they say that anathema is equivalent to giving the death penalty. Wow. And so you'll have modern Orthodox apologists. I mean, and they will try to sell people this, but you have to go to the, the, the canonical documents themselves, the canon law reference works. They'll try to, because modern day people will say, oh no, it's just medicinal. Oh, it's just, you know, it's just a warning. Oh, you know, it's a bad idea, but we're trying to kind of help people to understand the severity of the problem, but, but we're not applying it in a mean way. And it's like, no, it's the, it's the death penalty. And it's applied to anyone who's not under an Eastern Orthodox bishop, who doesn't follow their calendar, who uses unleavened bread in mm. communion, or even believes that uh, Jesus ate unleavened bread at the Last Supper. supper. Um, if you don't bow down and kiss images, you're accursed. You're going to hell, definitely, for sure. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really, really big problem. But if you go in with that evangelical paradigm, because you were kind of taught the gospel growing up, you go in there and you just filter it all out. You just mm. filter it all out. And it's, I can't tell you how many priests I've even talked to. They know what anathema means. They say, yep, that's what anathema means. And they say, I don't believe that people outside of the Orthodox Church aren't Christians, even though I know our canons laws, canon laws say that. So there are a plethora of Orthodox priests out there who don't even believe their own canons. And so they bring people into their church under their false pretense of what the Orthodox Church even believes because they refuse to believe what the canons say. And they'll they'll tell other priests privately, oh, yeah, I don't believe that other people aren't Christians. But, yeah, I do recognize that this says that they aren't Christians, Mm -hmm. but I don't believe it anyway. So they actually anathematize themselves by rejecting their own canons, but still live with a cassock and a cross on and conduct the liturgy. All of that stuff, when they're called, oh, Holy Father, people kiss the priest's hand, you know, and they get absolution from the priest. And that priest does not believe what the canons teach. Wow. Well, let's uh, let's talk about how you got sold out into this. Uh, I'm assuming that your wife followed you into Eastern Orthodoxy when you went there. Yeah, we kind of went under in the same kind of attitude. Um, West is bad. East is cool. I like their mysticism, their mystical tradition, their deep theology, their philosophical theology. 
all of the Western legal rigid categories and all they do is fight and divide with each other. And this church is unchanging and look, it's one church and you know, it's unbroken continuity, okay. all that stuff, you know, so hit it, all it, the it didn't right cause buttons. any marital strife for you then when you made this transition. Thank God. No. What about becoming a priest? Uh, was she cool with that? And what, what did that look like for you? Did you have to go to seminary or how did that work? Yeah, I went to a seminary uh, in New York, an Orthodox seminary in New York. Um, I did three years to get an MDiv there. And pardon me, spent another year and got a, a master's in theology as well. And so, yeah, I went through the, uh, the that, that program, uh, came back, went back down to Florida and was ordained, uh, served in a, a small mission church there in uh, just south of Orlando and just kind of kind of did the thing. I worked full time as a hospice chaplain while I was, uh, um, you know, uh, serving at a mission church there. And uh, finally, uh, that that mission church, the, the bishop uh, told me that he wanted to kind of close it. It was like a 10, 12 year old mission that you know, didn't seem sustainable to him. So, so he just wanted me to cool my jets for a while while another something would open up in the meantime, something, uh, didn't open up anywhere else. So I kind of like helped out at another local Orthodox church for a time and then got called up to a church that needed a pastor, if needed a priest, uh, in, uh, Pennsylvania. And so I served there in, in Pennsylvania for a while. And your family just following you along being supportive? Yeah, yeah, it was all it was all good. And when see, I did when I kind of discovered the penal substitutionary atonement issue at seminary, and started finding the fathers, you know, te- the the church fathers like John Chrysostom, et cetera, you know, teaching this this doctrine. So I thought for a while, hey, I'm just gonna like I'm gonna be the guy who's extra patristic teaching penal substitutionary atonement. And so I thought I could just kind of stay, and maybe I could like reinvigorate that doctrine, even though everybody was rejecting it especially at, at the time. You were trying um, to fit penal substitutionary atonement into Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, yeah. m- maybe in addition to Christus Victor, the Christus Victor model. You probably weren't rejecting that, but you were trying to fit penal substitutionary atonement into it. Correct. Yeah. I, I would have said that, you know, the Christus Victor model is true insofar that Christ did defeat death by death. You know, he did defeat yeah. death. Yes. Um, and so in that sense, the Christus model, uh, uh, Christus Victor model is perfectly sound. It's just incomplete in terms of, you know, a theory of atonement. And so I thought, okay, great. I'm just going to like complete the picture by, you know, being uber patristic, by being uber orthodox, you know. And so I was trying to be faithful to what I saw as the the church father's teaching. But then I got to the point when I started realizing some of these other sort of canonical issues like, because I mean, you talk to I don't know how many priests, and they're going to say, "Oh yeah, anathema doesn't mean anathema." And so it's like you don't. It's not like in seminary you go through like each ecumenical council, and then look at each canon. Like when you go through canon law, you just kind of like do like a broad overview. You kind of look at some basic you know, major, maybe major issues, but you're not saying. I mean, you don't necessarily study all the anathemas. And say, what is the nature of this? What does this mean ecclesiologically? What does this mean about orthodox identity? What does this mean about ecumenical relations? Like you don't discuss those sorts of of issues, really. It's just like, oh, yeah, there's, you know, various things to talk about. So many areas you can talk about. Just don't look over here. Mm. You know, it's like the Wizard of Oz or something like that. Just don't look over here. So it's like this kind of like area where you're, you know, not really looking at like the like the fine print of what anathema means. So you could spend your whole life in the Orthodox church, even as a priest. I even have met priests that went to seminary with me who said, I've never even heard of the Synodicon, which is like an exceptionally famous document that goes through and curses people, you know, all of the enemies of the Orthodox church. So it's like, I don't know why, well, actually I do know why he, he doesn't, you know, this particular person doesn't know it, but it has to do with some of the ec- excessive ecumenism that's a part of his jurisdiction. So they hide all of that, even from the priests, so that the priests don't have to deal with, you know, like the, the, the any conflict of conscience that might arise from knowing about the Synodicon. But then you have other churches, like more like a Russian Orthodox church, they might do the 
ritually recite the Sonaticon, this 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 text that contains series of curses against all of the enemies of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, they might do that yearly, you know, and be proud of it and say, this is a cool thing. This is what we do. So it's like you have some, in some cases, priests who don't even know about it. And then you have these other cases where just even your regular layman in an Orthodox church knows about it and they don't know how anybody couldn't know about it. And then the priest over here says, I don't know how anybody could know about it. And so it's like, you have this great con like division within like a soft division within the Eastern Orthodox church of, of great disparity of, of knowledge and, you know, access to, to these things. And well, so when I started to discover those fine print details, I was like, I don't believe that people who aren't in the Orthodox church are, I like I don't believe that they're not Christians. Mm. I believe they are Christians. Like I had an evangelical heart. I was you know like in that sense, you know, it's like my friends loved me. Like I worked at a hospital with other chaplains. Like I'm not going to say that they're not Christians. I worked as a hospice chaplain. If you have an Eastern Orthodox priest who's also serving as a chaplain, I don't think he could actually really function as a chaplain and really affirm that anybody else is a Christian. Mm. Well, and in integrity, with integrity. While we're kind of on this point here about the the people not knowing or not being on the same page, I guess, from church to church, here's been my understanding of what Eastern Orthodoxy looks like uh, with its taxonomy or its denominational breakdown. So I'm going to throw it out there to you and let you fix me. All right. So my idea has been Eastern Orthodoxy is like this big umbrella that refers to many different types of Orthodox churches. And under that umbrella, you have the Greek expression, Greek Orthodox, the Oriental expression, Oriental Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, etc. And you have these different expressions of Eastern Orthodoxy, but they all fit into this big heading of Eastern Orthodoxy. They're just different based on geography and then maybe some certain traditions that they each employ that would that would differ because their geography is different and they have so much history within that geography. That's been my understanding. How close am I? <laughs> You're pretty close, um, except uh, Oriental Orthodox, like the Coptic Orthodox Church or the Armenians or the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church or the Indian, like Malankara, they're called Orthodox churches. Those aren't under the same umbrella with the Eastern Orthodox. Th that's right, because there was a break off in like the fifth century or something with the Oriental Orthodox, uh, whereas the the schism with East and West was like the big one was 1054, I guess, right? Um, yes. But mm -hmm. yeah, that okay. Now, I, now I'm remembering a little bit. The Oriental Orthodox was back earlier because there was a disagreement on something that was pretty significant. I can't remember what that was. Yeah, it was at the at Chalcedon, you know, Chalcedon. and it was Christ being in with two natures in one person. And so the Coptics understood that a little bit differently than what are today called the Eastern Orthodox, which then also included, you know, Rome. Uh, you know, the Western Orthodox as well. So you had like this like huge Roman territory, you know, uh, and then you kind of had like some, some of this did end up getting caught up into Islamic politics because, you know, when Muslims came along and swept through and started owning a lot of this territory and made communication between the churches very difficult. And so some of these divisions were exacerbated by mm -hmm. by that, by those things. So which flavor were you? Were you Greek Orthodox? Um, so I was ordained in the Russian Orthodox Church outside oh. of Russia. Uh, and then I uh, ended up finishing serving on, in the Orthodox Church in America, which is abbreviated the OCA. And so they're all in communion with each other, except now there's a schism between the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox, or between the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Moscow. What's that They're about? in schism with each other. That happened because uh, the patriarch of Constantinople is in many ways uh, part of a very, he's like a part of a dying little area. His geographical territory is very small. And so he gets basically all of his funding from American churches. American, and, and, and you're talking about the guy who's that, you said patriarch, right? Yeah, he's. Yep, that's the head of their church. He's patriarch Bartholomew is his name. The You can sometimes one. see him holding hands and hugging the Pope. Oh, okay. So, so he's the current one. This is a current contemporary schism. Yes, current contemporary schism, uh, except everyone who's in communion with the Greeks 
or most, I guess most, I don't know if all is the proper term, but most, if not all, of the people who are in communion with the Russians are also in communion with Constantinople as well. It's just that Moscow and Constantinople are in schism, which hypothetically should be impossible. Um, one of them is the church and one of them isn't. And so they get to fight over who is the one true church amongst themselves as they like. It just yeah. kind of shows the lie of their of their theory of, of church unity. It's one of those things. It's like when you lose someone and say, oh, well, they were never a part of the church <laughs> yeah, anyway. Right. We're still one. And then you lose another side. Oh, yeah, we we're one and we've always won. You know, and then you lose another one. Oh, yeah, we're one and we've always won. And just like keeps getting narrower and narrower. Until there's one. Like, yeah, until there's one. It's always and now you me. also have true Orthodox churches, which are in communion with none of the other Orthodox churches, and they're the true Orthodox church. Um, and they have good arguments to to support their case from their perspective. Uh, did, I may have cut you off. Did you finish describing that schism between those two, the Moscow and Constantinople guys? Oh, uh, yeah. So Patriarch Bartholomew gets most of his funding from uh, Western and especially like American churches that through their giving process, it ends up supporting their total patriarchal, I mean, uh, Episcopal system with the patriarch at the top of it. And so he's involved in a lot of American politics. And so he was basically brought into uh, a dispute in the Ukraine. So there you had a, an Orthodox church that was native to Ukraine. And that native Ukrainian Orthodox church was in communion with Moscow. Mm. And so instead of working together with that Ukrainian, that native Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Patriarch of Constantinople went basically into that jurisdiction and started an, a national Ukrainian Orthodox Church that paralleled the Ukrainian, the indigenous Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And so it was a part of a lot of the political machinations of, of what's happening in Ukraine, even right now. This was before this current uh, military conflict that's there um you know this was all part of the the setup of it mm. um you know as as these things were being kind of like engineered along the way so that now you have this nationalistic ukrainian orthodox church that and, that, and then they persecute the indigenous ukrainian orthodox church and so now there's like a you know, two parallel Orthodox churches there, which also theoretically shouldn't be able to happen if you believe the claims of the Eastern Orthodox churches. It gets political and confusing in a hurry. The Eastern Orthodox church basically became an arm of the state. It was a state church. So mm. they would impose the theory of icons through state force, or they would reject the theory of icons based on state force. So whoever was the king of the time could set up or dispose of whoever's in charge of the Orthodox Church at the time. So they could get rid of a patriarch if they wanted to, or they could bring on a patriarch if they wanted to. And so a lot of their theological developments were connected in some way with the fact that it was just a state-operated church. Um, is the Eastern Orthodox Church now, generally speaking, uh, growing or shrinking? In the West, it seems like it's growing because of these sort of specious arguments that these sort of fake kind of arguments that come up that try to show that it's unchanging because it's false, that their theology has never changed. It's false. They just somehow maintained that ritual or ceremonial continuity, which gives the veneer of substantive continuity. And so people fall for that because if you, if you do selective enough reading, there's continuity. And you keep people looking at these areas. Well, of course, it's unchanged. It's never changed. And it's even called the liturgy of John Chrysostom. And he lived in the 400s. Like, you know, of course, it's the same. It has the same name, doesn't it? You know, and we still say this and we still say that, you know, but they also say most holy Theotokos save us. Oh, well, it doesn't really mean save us until you read Gregory Palamas. And oh, well, we don't. And then they have like this whole host of compensatory mechanisms to try to def or deflection mechanisms, you know, to try to keep people from seeing the significance of it. But when you meet people who are from the East and who are cradle and they've grown up in generations of Orthodox, I mean, these icons that work miracles are very persuasive to them. But then you have charismatic churches that might do some wacky stuff that also have these apparent miracles. But then you also have Tibetan Buddhists that do things that are apparently miraculous. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have these kind of like 
like pagan proof textings, you know, from like miraculous icons and someone got healed to becoming now apologetic things for the proof of Eastern Orthodoxy. What is the Eastern Orthodox view of the Bible? And when you were uh, functioning as a priest there in Pennsylvania, did you share that view or did you have a different view? So at seminary, you could find what would be called prima scriptura, which could be considered actually budding up and blending together with uh, sola scriptura. When you start getting into like kind of like the fine tooth de uh, details of how some of these people unpack these things, because even though we affirm sola scriptura, um, uh, you and I, we affirm sola scriptura, the Bible actually delegates authority to you know pastors and teachers and stuff like that so there are authorities within a sola scriptura model mm -hmm. so if you if you take that and say okay well if there's authorities how do we relate that so that's where you start getting into some theories of like prima scriptura so within the russian orthodox stream of eastern orthodoxy you have a huge uh, inflow of some protestant ideas through Russia in the 1700s, 1800s, they were reading Protestant materials in their seminaries. So you have like this kind of Protestantizing movement, like even Dostoevsky modeled one of his most holy characters off of a Russian bishop who was reading and promoting Protestant materials. So people don't even understand that when they love Dostoevsky and they love some of that piety, they're actually reading the in Protestant influence into the Russian Orthodox Church. So Dostoevsky doesn't represent a pure Eastern Orthodoxy. You know, uh, Dostoevsky is the famous author of Crime and Punishment, also the famous author of the Brothers Karamazov, you know, which is considered some of the greatest literature, you know, written in the Western world. And so, or I guess that would be the Eastern world, but, you know, part of our kind of Western canon of, sure. of literature. And so, you know, uh, but in the Greek, it was like a little bit different. And so, but they're all hypothetically one church. And so you can kind of hide in the Russian Orthodox side of things with some Protestant sympathies, but they'll be less ecumenical. Or you could hide as a former evangelical in the Greek world because they're more ecumenist. Mm. But there are different ways of hiding, right? So you can be pure and traditionalist in the Russians, but you're still influenced by Protestantism. Or you could be in the Greek and be more ecumenist. And now we kind of agree with different people to now where you had the, 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 one of the famous bishops in the Greek Orthodox Church who blessed uh, um, the baptism of a child of a gay marriage. Wow. So, you know, that's what they have uh, happening uh, there. Mm -hmm. So by the time uh, you get to like seminary and you're discussing what is the relationship of authority, they're not looking to the canonical documents. We're not we weren't referencing. Well, let's go back to the Jerusalem Council of 1672, where we actually formally define. And this council was accepted among all of the bishops and all of the all of the patriarchates. So technically, it's the authoritative document. Because it was accepted. Some people say, oh, it was only a local document. No, it wasn't only a local document. It was accepted as authoritative by everyone. So even if it was done locally, it was still approved universally amongst all of the Orthodox churches. And so they actually define the relationship between scripture and tradition in the Catholic way or a more Catholicizing way, maybe not modern Catholic, because after Vatican II, you have some, or at Vatican II, you have some major uh, reframing of what. Roman Catholicism even is, it kind of departs from Vatican I in some kind of obvious ways, and Trent as well. Um, but uh, so with the uh, within the Eastern Orthodox world, you have this Jerusalem Council of 1672, where they say scripture and tradition are of equal authority, that it's the same to be taught by scripture as by tradition, that they have the same authority, and it's, they're both equally uh, inerrant. And that's in that Jerusalem Council of 1672. I never affirmed that. Wow. But I never know, knew we had to because no bishops talk about it because they're being hosted by America. Eastern Orthodox churches are being hosted by the product of evangelical Protestant worldview that made so, America possible. So did you function in your like day-to-day -day ministry life? with just ha having in mind the Bible is my authority, that that was kind of what, what you had in mind? Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. And you'll find several, many priests that, that, that do that as well because they're coming out of evangelical environments and they were never made to confront some of these canonical documents. And so that's one of the things that I really, really try to stress with Protestants as they're dealing with Eastern Orthodoxy is go to the canonical documents themselves. Go to the formal places where they say what they teach. Don't ask your local priest. Mm -hmm. He's going to tell you any number of things, depending on his background, who his bishop is, who influenced his bishop. Like you'll get wildly diverse answers so that and often the priest just wants you to come into their church. Hmm. So he's going to so you might have like a very strict, you know, traditionalist priest who's going to give you this, the tough love story. And then you're going to have your other one who's going to give you like the oh, we welcome everybody. And this is the fullness of Christianity. And it's not like, you know, old grandma Betsy from the Baptist church, you know, your old grandma who prayed for you and brought you to church and like you were basically like brought to Christ through the, the prayers and, and like labors of your grandma, they won't tell you that she's going to hell, mm. you know? And so, <laughs> you know, you have to, a person has to go to these canonical documents like the Jerusalem council of 1672, where they reject the, you know, Protestantism, like, like the doctrine of justification by faith alone through grace alone. Um, and of course, Orthodox have like a genetic inability to understand what faith alone even means. It's like they think that we mean assent, mental assent only. And it's just like, it doesn't matter what you tell them, how many times you tell them, how many confessional documents you take them to. It's like they just can't understand the language of faith alone. Like it's, it's they, like they, a they bizarre mental with, block. They, they come back with, oh, so you're just saying you just have to acknowledge that Jesus died and then you're saved. You know, yeah, and, 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 and it's like, well, yeah, that can be really difficult uh, to explain to somebody. Antinomianism. Comes... That's what that's what Protestantism right. is to them. You know, just constant antinomianism. Uh, well, uh, I'm assuming your view of the Bible played a a key role in your eventual conversion and your born again experience. So explain that. How did you as an Eastern Orthodox priest come to the point where you say, no, wait a second. I'm, I'm on the wrong path here. And. Uh, what was the fallout when you got to that point? So I could even back up a little bit to that moment I mentioned to you, like when my son was on, on the way, Yeah, you know, like a part of that was like either God's right or I'm right, you know? So whenever there's a dispute between God's word and something else, God's word wins. Amen. Um, and so it's just a matter of drawing closer and closer to clarity about what the God, what what God's word you know says kind of referring also to your theological triaging that you mentioned uh earlier maybe that was before we we came on it's a it's a helpful concept you know like theological triaging yeah. but you know wherever there's a dispute between bible and tradition bible wins but mm -hmm. if tradition is in accord with the bible then you know it's i think mm -hmm. it's legit you know um and so that was uh, a major process for me. So when I start discovering like, okay, so if I don't bow down and kiss icons and the seventh ecumenical council defines it as with affection, like you have to bow down and kiss these things with like devotional affection. What does what does that mean? Like French kiss? <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, and so, you know, if you don't do that, then you're anathema, which means accursed and going to hell. And I said, that doesn't match with the Bible at all. Because they usually explain it as freedom. You're free to venerate the icon. Like, ah, uh, you know, the idea is like, obviously, we're not idolaters. Obviously, we don't attribute power to it. You know, like, obviously, we don't think that this is like a local housing of God. Like the kind of things that you might think of in terms of like gross paganism or gross idolatry. Um, kind of like a superficial version of idolatry. And so it's like it passes the superficial idolatry test. You know, but it's substantive idolatry in in other ways. Mm. But then when I realize that it's not a question of freedom, it's a question of binding the conscience to it. Like there is no way we can get out of the second commandment that easily. Like I could understand maybe, you know, to get to an anti position. Like okay, we have pictures of Jesus in an action Bible, and that's cool. Mm. 
you know, or we, you know, something like that. Like, I'm not going to be up in arms about that. I know some people might say, I don't even want a picture of Jesus in an action Bible, you know, and I can sympathize with them too. Um, but like, in terms of like, it's not a question of choosing between those two. It's a, it's, it's one where you have to not only have the picture of Jesus, but you have to bow to it and you have to kiss it. And then on certain special seasons, you have to prostrate in front of it mm. to the point where if I don't do it, I'm damned. Now that's neo-nomianism, right? You know, mm. that's, that's a new law Yeah. and I have a problem there. So when it came to that dispute over, you know, the Bible's authority or tradition's authority, Bible wins every time, not even a question. Was it like you woke up one day and you were like, I'm an idolater? Or was that a, a pretty slow fade? When I started seeing, when I started kind of examining and realizing that it wasn't just those, like it wasn't just a question of freedom and it was a question of binding the conscience, that's when I started being like, Ugh. And it was kind of like an awakening. And, you know, it. I was uncomfortable with it in some ways. But prior to that, hmm. you know, it was just like, this is weird. I'm a little like I'm not an iconoclast, really. You know, like I'm not trying to go around and take a hammer to everybody's thing, you know. Uh, and so I'm not really into this whole venerating the icon, but I don't want to be a bad example. You know, and so I'm just going to kind of go through the motions and I'm just going to affirm as a hypothetical principle that we have freedom to do this or don't do that. Because the argument is, well, what if you had a picture of your grandma and, you know, or your wife and you went out to battle and all you had was the picture of your wife and you just kissed that picture before you went to bed? Wouldn't that be sweet? Well, sure, I guess that that would be sweet. That's how you take like an innocent free action that a person might do a, a soldier who's longing for his mm. wife and wants to get out of the battlefield. That's the only comfort he has at the end of a long day of blood and gore is to look at the picture of his wife and family. And he just kisses the picture before. And, you know, you might not even think twice about that. And that's like, they try to take that and soften you into their ritualism in the Orthodox church. Mm. And that's the exact analogy people use all the time. And so I was kind of doing it under that sort of like paradigm analogy, whatever you want to call it, you know, under that kind of way of thinking about it. But then, like, like I said, when I got to that question of like, really, if I don't do like, then it became gross to me, like really, mm. really gross. Like I can't, I can't do this. So you get to the point where you reject their atonement theory. You're rejecting this idolatry that's taking place uh, and all kinds of other things. I'm sure that, that you're rejecting that we haven't gotten gotten to here, but you're a priest at this point still, right? I mean, this is happening while you're functioning as a priest in that church. Yeah. So this is happening around the COVID time when the churches were closed. Hmm. And cause I'm trying to find catechetical material to, to give the, my, my flock, you know, they didn't have, you know, it was like a very like low threshold of knowledge in terms of like what they knew or even affirmed. And, you know, because of the history of the, that area geographically, like they didn't typically or often trust priests. Mm. They often didn't trust bishops. And so it was like, I didn't want to be just like, a, like one priest in a line of priests that just said this priest's opinion. So I thought, let me go back to these old canonical documents and start reprinting and republishing them which is kind of what I did. So like I republished, you know, like that confession of Decithius uh, from the Jerusalem council that I mentioned, uh, one from Peter Mogila, one from Philaret of Moscow. I combined them together into one big book, you know, so that, you know, I could like give these to my people. And so as I was going through that, this kind of process started to dawn on me to the point where I was like, I can't be here anymore. I can't be here in good conscience. And so that's when I started making that move to step away. What did your wife say? She was kind of like being informed along the same process with me. I'd share my discoveries, you know, and so it actually became, I have to say, a part of a spiritual renewal for our family. Wow. As difficult and tragic as it was and painful to separate, it was also exciting 
because it was like the freedom and the goodness of of the gospel, you know, of of all of this was just like like we were just centering and centering on that hmm. that it became like a kind of like a great thing, you know, to the point where it's like, man, this is this is a wonderful thing to be uh, discovering. Like I'm drawing closer to Christ. Mm-hmm. Like this stuff is like I want to get this away from me, but like. My heart wasn't like so caught up in what I was losing. It was kind of more caught up in, you know, and what I was gaining. And so it became like a, like from glory to glory, you know, kind of thing. Where'd you start going to church? Uh, we visited a friend of mine that I had made there, uh, a uh, Reformed Baptist church hmm. in Scranton. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And that was, that's a pretty big difference going from a Eastern Orthodox setting to a Reformed Baptist church, isn't it? I mean, that's, pretty radically yeah. different. Well, since I had grown up, you know, in like, you know, you know, evangelical and Protestant churches, it it wasn't completely unfamiliar. Sure. Um and I do have to say that they abided by uh the regulative principle. No, oh, wow. You know, to the point that their church service was very reverent. Did it uh like to the point of a cappella singing? No, I think they didn't have a cappella. I, okay. I, I recall a piano being there. Okay. Um, you know, but they did sing psalms very intentionally. They had a nice hymnal uh that they used and so it was like it was a great it was probably the ideal transition, hmm. I think. I don't know if I could have handled like going to like a you know, uh str- strobe lights and smoke hmm. machines and stuff like that. I, I I I don't go for that anyway even now. Um I am more in the like of a regular principle guy at heart, even if I'm not maybe as strict as as it could get. It can get really, really uh, yes. intense. T- talk um, about uh, neonomianism. That that's a fast track to that. Usually, is when you get really fired up about regulative principle. It can go there in a hurry. Yeah, so I'm more of like a soft regulative principle in that sense. You know, where I do want it to be grounded in scripture, normed yeah. by scripture. Uh, regulated uh, by scripture, but all of scripture, you know, and I think that using like analogy of scripture as well, you know, so it's like if David's constantly talking about music in worship, you know, to me, like musical instruments in worship, like I'm going to think that like that probably doesn't mean it should be forbidden Mm. in the New Testament church. I think that's like a tacit kind of blessing into the church i don't think you know like these early jewish synagogues if they ever used a musical instrument well now that paul's come into town and we've been persuaded by him about the messiah you know let's let's go bury all of our musical instruments in the backyard kind of thing i don't think they were doing that um i i'm curious when you stopped saying we and us referring to eastern orthodoxy i've I've observed that with people here who convert out of a uh, a movement that they were immersed in, whether that was Mormonism or something else, it kind of there like comes this point where they say, you know what, I'm no longer going to say our doctrine anymore because I'm not a part of that anymore. Was that difficult for you as someone who perhaps found his identity in the Eastern Orthodox Church? Um. It's an interesting question. I'm trying to think back, like, you know, if I, you know, I, because I think of like the gradations of the, you know, like of the psychological kind of like processing, you know, it's like, you can kind of get to the point where it's like, well, this is what the fathers say, instead of saying, this is what we say. Yeah. Or this is the the Orthodox Church's position on this rather than this is our position. But it, but it can almost happen imperceptibly. You know, and I actually, I think now that you're mentioning it, I probably went through some of that process earlier, even when I still identified as Eastern Orthodox because of my issue with penal substitutionary atonement, because I affirmed that as an Eastern Orthodox person. Hmm. And that was countercultural, you know, because the modern, this modern Eastern Orthodox Church is just imitating the, the ancient church of john chrysostom's era or cyril of alexandria's era they're just imitating it Mm. and calling it the same so i'm saying from like the pulpit or from you know saying you know he died in our place and on our behalf so i was already used to saying this is what the fathers say or this is what the orthodox church 
taught in this century or, or what we confirm or confess. So, you know, so like the we and the us and the they and the fathers and the like that was already probably being worked out in my mind in that time period already. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I, I can tell by some of the things you've said and by some of the books behind you that you're now a uh, Calvinist or at least Calvinistic and uh, you Calvinian, I'll say Calvinian <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're in vocational ministry. Again, you are pastoring a church in Arkansas and it's a yep. Christian missionary Alliance church. So now can you bridge that gap for for me where you came out of the Eastern Orthodox church, you're attending this reformed Baptist church and now you're here. What's the connection? What is a Christianary, Christian Missionary Alliance church? What was the draw there? Explain that. Yeah, uh, good question. So the Christian and Missionary Alliance was founded a little over 100 years ago, not as a denomination, kind of like a more like a movement um, with a gentleman named A.B. Simpson. A.B. Simpson was a Presbyterian. And so he didn't leave in the sense of like renouncing his Reformed heritage. Uh, he maintained his reformed heritage, but shifted in his doctrine of baptism. And then I think he also kind of picked up some of that era's dispensational thought as mm -hmm. well. But by and large, he maintained his reformed, uh, I, I guess, theological worldview or paradigm. And so I felt comfortable with A.B. Simpson because I do kind of lean reformed in that way. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm Calvinistic, you know, I would, you know, I'm nobody's obviously nobody's like agreeing with every jot and tittle of John Calvin ever, yeah. you know, he's just like a significant teacher of the church that we respect his voice. And we feel like we should engage with his thoughts seriously rather than just waving our hand and dismissing him. You know, that's kind of how reformed us reformed people, you know, would probably relate to John Calvin as a significant teacher whose voice we should engage with because of, you know, the the, the weight he carried and, and the respect he garnered, you know, at the fount of our, our kind of stream within the Protestant Reformation. Um, you know, but I also like guys like Walter Marshall. I like William Perkins. I like Thomas Boston, you know, and so I like a lot of that Puritan stream of, of thought. I think they had a lot of things right. You know, do I think that we should ban Christmas? No, I, I like Christmas. So I, I don't go that far in my <laughs> regulative principle, you know, kind of good thing. Job. Um, you know, and I think it's good to, uh, I, I think it's good to uh, see time uh, in a sacred way, you know, like to claim time for Christ, you know, so meditating on like the, on Pascha or Easter, you know, on the resurrection of Christ. I think that's a very important thing to do, even though I wouldn't want to bind anyone's conscience to it. Yeah. I think it's valuable for us to not see time as just like serial, meaningless time into until Christ comes. I think it's good to, to convert the, 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 the yearly cycles into something that, that uh, honors what, Jesus uh, Christ did for us on the cross or in, in incarnating as well. And I think we have an analogy of that with, you know, the sacred year in the old covenant uh, period as well. So I would relate that to the regulative principle. Um, but I guess before I far uh, go uh, too far afield. Um, so yeah, I like AB Simpson. Have you, you're familiar with AW Tozer? Oh yeah. Yeah. He's also a Christian and missionary Alliance guy. And so, you know, I feel like I had a lot of things to kind of like work through and process, you know, in terms of like my theological shifting. I knew it was a big thing to go from Eastern Orthodox to to the into the Protestant world. And so I kind of like my my core was was Christ alone, you know, the, the five solas, essentially, you know, and I wanted to be around people who believed the Bible and loved Jesus. And so. Just talking with some of, I have a friend who's a former Eastern Orthodox priest, um, you know, and he kind of connected me with some friends of his who were pastors and other. And so I just kind of started talking. I was like, you know what? The Christian and Missionary Alliance, they try to follow the Bible. They try to, you know, they try to honor this fourfold gospel. I'm, you know, this is a continuationist tradition, but they're not like wildly off the rails, you know, like they're trying to maintain a semblance of lowercase o orthodoxy, you know, and so that was very comfortable. I wanted something that had heritage, you know, so A.B. Simpson is, you know, an older gentleman from about 100 years ago. He kind of blended into the Presbyterian church, which blends back into 
the English Anglican, you know, Anglican uh, church, which blends back into the, the medieval church, which blends all the way back. And I wanted to be able to mentally, I guess I had to for myself, be able to mentally, you know, connect all those dots. Mm. And so that kind of brought me, because I still do believe in the importance of continuity. And I believe that, you know, even though people go into the Eastern Orthodox Church under the semblance of continuity, I think as Protestants, we need to be able to articulate the legitimate continuity that we have. Yes. We are the continuity of that church. Mm. We're not making stuff up as we go. Uh, sure, we don't put all of our disagreements and divisions or or separations under a rug and sweep it under or hide it behind the icon, which is what the Eastern Orthodox mm -hmm. do. You know, they try to hide all of it behind the icon or sweep it under the rug or whatever like that. And like, don't look at it. We have this nice, pretty picture. Look how beautiful our church is. Don't look at the division over there, you know, and a lot of people fall for that. Mm -hmm. And I think like our arguments and our debates are like way more out in the forefront and that has disadvantages, but it also has advantages as yeah. well. The the main advantage being honesty. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So we know where we stand, why we stand where we stand, and we can trace our history. You know, and, and, so, and history is messy, and two thousand years of history is just difficult. I mean, we. I mean, we're being honest here. I mean, there's some messy stuff in church history, and there are periods where it's difficult to discern exactly what was going on, how Jesus was building his church during those eras, but we work with what God has given us and we can trust that there is that continuity. Yeah. And I think in the body of Christ, you know, it's not necessarily always the case that the toe is going to recognize the elbow, Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and maybe the toe and the elbow have to be separated in a, in an outward sense, you know, but I think when we talk about having like a spirit of unity, you know, or having the same mind, I don't think it literally means being like the Borg, mm -hmm. you know, um, like we think the same thoughts, you know, uh, kind it's of thing. I think unity, it's a spirit of togetherness. Not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity is the what we like to say on this podcast, that there's unity amid diversity, uh, which is God himself. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit's not the Father. Uh, the God yeah. himself is displays unity amid diversity and his body is the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, thank you for allowing me to talk to you about your journey. Uh, I know you've gone through this story several times and uh, it is a story of God's patience and grace and uh, any, anything you want to say, I'll give you the last word. Oh, well, I mean, thank you for letting me come on, you know, um, it's uh, it's 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 a pleasure to to share with you and to to get to know you, you know as well. It you know seems like you're doing a really good thing here uh, on your podcast, so I'm honored to have been included, you know, uh, amongst it. Uh, I, in terms of you know Eastern Orthodoxy, you know, I, I I would only affirm that you know a little bit of education makes them seem very persuasive, mm -hmm. um, but a little bit more education starts to put a dent in that, and a lot more education shows that. They're just an old sectarian kind of belief system uh, that was, you know, kind of tucked away in some older European countries or in Middle Eastern countries where they weren't even allowed to produce their own theological textbooks, mm -hmm. which is why they would outsource them from Roman Catholics and Protestants and stuff like that. So they're just kind of like a frozen tradition that didn't think through a lot of the issues that we did in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. So it's it, it may give that appearance of seeming older and, and, you know, but I think in some ways it's older in that it hasn't actually developed. You know, they kind of got frozen at a certain time. And I think some of that actually may have happened around icons. And I think it relates to the curse of those who uh, worship images where God says those who who worship them become like them. Wow. You know, yeah. they have noses, but do not breathe. They have ears, but do not hear eyes, but do not see. And those who worship them become like unto them mm -hmm. frozen and dead. And I think that that's what the Orthodox church kind of offers. But, you know, if you're evangelical, you have to understand that that paradigm, if you, if you project that into there, it'll give the appearance of, you know, being able to be consistent with what you believe, but it's not. Their paradigm is alien to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, not to say that everyone in those churches is unsaved, not to say that there are, I know people in those churches that, that believe and trust in Christ alone. I, I, I've met them, you know, but, uh, 
in terms of the system itself, it's not friendly or conducive to the gospel. Well, uh, what Joshua was just reciting there, I believe Psalm 115, uh, about the curse of idolatry becoming like what you worship. And uh, G.K. Beale has an interesting book, We Become What We Worship. Uh, there's a lot that I disagree with G.K. Beale on, but that's a good, that's a very interesting good book. So um, pick that up if you haven't read that. That'll take you into some interesting places and help you understand not just Eastern Orthodoxy, but other false churches. So, uh, Joshua, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. I think this conversation is really going to help a lot of people. I hope so. That's, that's my prayer. 